Hey, so um, welcome everyone uh, to the IPFS meetup. Uh, the, the way we're going to proceed through tonight is we're going to have a, a number of speakers. Uh, I'll give a really short intro to IPFS uh, because I think most people kind of like understand some amount of it. Uh, Ryan will also give a pretty short intro to Blockstack. Then we'll have uh, kind of the meat of the event. Uh, so we will talk about, uh, so I'll give a talk about IPLD, which is the core data format for IPFS. Uh, Ryan will talk about uh, desktop application uh, for Blockstack. Uh, uh, Christian will talk about, uh, from consensus, we'll talk about um, Uport, I believe, uh, or something else. Uh, and then uh, Zuko will talk about uh, Zcash and or Tahoe LAFS. Uh, so, uh, and at the end, if anybody else wants to talk about anything else, we can open for a little bit of time. Um, we are happy to go as long as, and talk about all these things, or even open up to discussion later, uh, but we also don't want to keep talking at you forever. So I know that at some point you'll get tired. Uh, and I should mention there's drinks on us, so if you want to get a drink, um, we have some, like I think, limit, but if you go and get a drink, uh, you can ask for it on us. Uh, some of you might be thinking, oh man, I should have gone go, go get a drink. Uh, get it, I guess, at a break. We can do a break in between, or get it after. Uh, cool. All right. So I will just go through and uh, give that short intro. This is a little bit outdated. And oh, sorry. My I like inverting colors. Um, sweet. So that's New York. That's not Berlin. Uh, all right. Uh, how many people have heard about IPFS? Uh, all right. A whole bunch of people. Awesome. So in the beginning, there was packet switching, and then the internet, and the web. And now, what's happening is that inspired by Bitcoin and a whole bunch of other peer-to-peer -peer technologies in the past, we're taking, as a community, a whole bunch of different projects are taking the web and making it, uh, lifting it from the location uh, of its web servers and making secure links between uh, content to content and uh, secure links to programs and we're making publicly verifiable computing and a whole bunch of amazing stuff is happening, right? So uh, you can think of Bitcoin and Ethereum as two examples of um, publicly verifiable computing networks that uh, are structuring the content and applications that we use in the internet in a very different way than HTTP does, right? So you can trust links in these kinds of networks. You can prove something about the data that you're getting. You can prove something about the computation that's happening. Um, this has the effect of making a much more secure computation platform, right? At the end of the day, all computing is really just about functions and data. And really, code is data, so it's just about functions happening on top of other functions and so on. Uh, but it, it's programs operating on a whole bunch of bits and manipulating those bits, changing them, moving them around, and, and so on. And out of that mess, you get the amazing applications that you use daily. So the web that we have now, or you know, before uh, these new projects, uh, has a whole bunch of problems around uh, you know, things like uh, it's inefficient in terms of having to go and fetch a whole bunch of stuff from the backbone because you only the facebook.com servers understand and can vouch for what facebook.com means, which is pretty inefficient when you think about it, right? Like, you don't need to, you shouldn't need to go to a server out in the middle uh, of the backbone to get served the same image you've seen many, many times. Um, links break. Uh, it would be nice if the web had memory. If you could create a link that was that, a link to a specific file forever and never have to change it. Uh, it is a terrible security model because the hosters of this data and content can change it underneath you at any moment in time. And we usually don't sign any of the content. So if you go and publish some, some data on, say, whatever social network you want to use, uh, that could be changed underneath the hood, and you, you wouldn't, may not even know it. Uh, so I've always been scheming to try and play a prank on someone to uh, insert an email that they never wrote in their own mailbox. So they're like, whoa, what? Uh, because that can happen, right? And like, that could happen today. Uh, and so it'd be really, really nice to move the web to a, a much more secure model for computation. 
there's also no offline use, right? So if, if right now our connectivity to the backbone broke, then we wouldn't be able to interact with each other, even though we have supercomputers, all of us, right? Like we probably have multiple supercomputers per person now. Uh, when you think about the computation power that's is sitting in this room, uh, we should be able to do things like collaborate on an etherpad without having to touch the cloud, right? It seems um, uh, straightforward. Uh, one of the big important problems as well is that uh, our dependence on the backbone of the internet and for all, for mediating all of our applications makes us very unsafe because at any point in time, anyone who cuts connectivity to the backbone has destroyed all of the superpowers and capabilities that you were afforded to by software, right? So you have the ability right now to communicate with whoever you want to communicate at the speed of light anywhere around the globe. And in a moment's notice that could go away, as, it, as people in Egypt found out one morning, and just by cutting a few wires, right? And so it would be really nice if the local area networks are still there, you should be able to continue messaging each other. Uh, so IPFS is a project to uh, try and solve some of these problems. We, do, of course, don't have the full story. Uh, all of these projects together, uh, you know, things like uh, IPFS and uh, projects that came before like Tahoe uh, and things like Bitcoin and Ethereum and Blockstack and so on are all annoyed by these problems and trying to fix things together. Uh, so at the core, the basic idea of IPFS is to say, imagine a web of Merkle links. So instead of linking files through URLs uh, that may change underneath the hood, what if you linked files with the hash of something? Think of it like Git or BitTorrent. Once you link things by hash, you can certify and verify that that content is the same. And you can create a web out of this. The same thing that, same data structure that powers all of these systems. You can think of IPFS as a huge Merkle web where all of these different kind of data structures can float. Uh, there's a whole application stack that's developing um, through a lot of different projects. This is more around a whole bunch of other, other things. but. Uh, the basic idea of IPFS is to say there's a whole bunch of hard peer-to-peer -peer network stuff that we have to do uh, to achieve full connectivity between peers, right? Because today you have a computational model where your computer, your desktop computer may open ports and so on, but maybe the browser can't. And maybe the browser can open WebRTC connections, but can't probably connect to another process. So we actually have to do a lot of hard connectivity work to make sure that wherever you have an IPFS node, it can talk to everything else. Uh, so we are taking that and creating a project called libp2p so that anyone who's making peer-to-peer -peer protocols can leverage that. Uh, and on top of that sits this, this thing we call IPLD, which is the, the Merkle-linked web that we're describing. And I'll talk more about that later. Uh, once you have IPLD moving around through this peer-to-peer -peer connectivity layer, you can represent things like file systems on top of it. You can represent things like blockchains. You can represent things like version control systems. You can represent full databases on top of something like this. Uh, and that's what the whole IPFS project is about. It's about thinking, separating the concerns of one part is connectivity and how you find and route content, and the other part is structuring data on top of this Merkle-linked web. Um, uh, cool, and LibP2P, by the way, is a large project in and of itself. Lots of hard work has gone into making all of these pieces work seamlessly together. So it, I will, yeah, I mean, some of you might have seen all of this. There's probably other talks that you can go watch and, and see more about introduction uh, and stuff. But yeah, uh, I'll leave it at that. Uh, there's a whole bunch of people using and hacking on IPFS. It's a, huge, it's a large open source project. Uh, and you can find us at ipfs.io. Uh, with that, I'll hand it over to Ryan, who can tell you about Blockstack. Nice talk, man. All right. This. this is good? Like that? Okay. Thank you. All right. Hey, everyone. Thank you all for coming. Uh, 
hope you guys enjoyed Juan's presentation. Um, okay, so uh, as Juan mentioned, this is a joint meetup between IPFS and Blockstack, and uh, you just heard about what IPFS is all about. And now I'm going to tell you, um, give you a short introduction to Blockstack and what it is. Uh, my name is Ryan Shea. Uh, I'm a co-founder of Blockstack Labs, uh, along with Mini Bali, and uh, we Blockstack Labs is a company that helps main maintain Blockstack uh, along with other companies and, and developers. Uh, and we have a community, a Slack community, uh, that you can join. Um, all this information is up on blockstack.org. And we have a bunch of people and we talk about uh, what Blockstack is and uh, the applications that are being built on top of it and, and how it works and so on. Um, a lot of good discussions about other projects in the space too. Uh, so uh, this is uh, blockstack.org. You guys can go and check it out. And Blockstack is a application platform for building decentralized applications that are secured for, by the blockchain, right? And it is a decentralized uh, blockchain secured application stack. So what it provides is services like identity, authentication, uh, DNS, and uh, user data storage, right? So. Uh, the idea is if you want to build an application that is decentralized, if you want to build an application maybe that doesn't have any servers or an application that uh, loads client side with the user that is more secure, uh, that doesn't rely on uh, a centralized uh, DNS system like uh, the ICANN DNS system that we all know and use. Uh, if you want to build an application that uh, maybe leverages some of the capabilities of the blockchain, then you can use uh, the services that are provided by Blockstack to make it much more easy for you to build these applications. Uh, and uh, I'll give you, walk you through exactly how it works and, and, and exactly uh, what services it provides. So you can think of there's the Blockstack base layer, there's the infrastructure, and then there are applications that uh, people build on top of it. So um, one way to think of the base layer of Blockstack is it's a directory system uh, that uses the blockchain for the secure directory service. So you can register an item, uh, and that can, item can represent anything. It can represent a person's identity, it can represent a thing, it can represent an idea, right? It can represent uh, some digital asset, right? And that asset, or person's identity, right, uh, token, can be owned by a public key or a set of keys, and that gives access control and rights that you can use to, um, these, these access control rights allow you to uh, change the, um, the access control rights in the future, and it allows you to do other operations like associating new data with uh, the token or transferring it between keys. Uh, so, and there are, services that are built on top of the core block stack infrastructure that provide the ability for people to register these, uh, these identities and then actually uh, manage them, right? And you can also go and look them up and, and interact with them. And there's a few that exist today, and uh, one example is the one name web app at onename.com, uh, but you can also interact with it in other ways. You have also the one name API, uh, there's a block stack command line interface that you can interact with. And then also there's a desktop application which you guys will get to see uh, at the end of the, the meetup. Uh, so all of these, you can think of them like, just like with the, if you guys are familiar with the Bitcoin network or the Ethereum network, uh, it's a uh, network that has entry points and y there are wallets or applications that have the ability to provide a window into the network, right? It's sim also similar to how, um, with torrents, you can have different torrent clients that all uh, speak the same language, right, in the same protocol. Uh, and so the way that Blockstack works is it uh, connects to the, so there's the Bitcoin peer-to-peer um, -peer network. Um, there's one very large Blockstack network that's currently in operation, and that operates on top of Bitcoin. But that said, uh, the way that Blockstack is set up is it's blockchain agnostic. So it could operate um, it operates as a virtual layer right now on top of the Bitcoin blockchain, but you could set an, up another block stack network that operates on a different blockchain, like Ethereum or Zcash or any other blockchain, because it just uses the blockchain underneath as um, 
a sequence, uh, in a sense, a sequence of database operations or database transactions. And it scans through those operations and then reconstructs the database of name to public key to data hash mappings, right? Um, and the way it does that is each of the block stack nodes, they actually connect to an individual Bitcoin node in the peer-to-peer -peer network. So you can think of it like the Bitcoin nodes connect to each other and they transmit transactions and then some, uh, some transaction processors uh, package up those transactions and distribute a new block to the network. But the block stack node just attaches onto an individual Bitcoin node and gives it superpowers so that it can then interpret this information in a new way and develop this directory database, right, for, for the identities and the assets. Uh, and so this is a demonstration of the block stack layers. So at the bottom you have the blockchain, right? And the blockchain, it's a sequence of blocks that keep getting updated uh, every, every uh, interval of time. And the block stack, no each block stack node, right? It connects to its own copy of the blockchain. Uh, and then it builds a database on top, as I mentioned, right? That's the virtual chain layer. So it takes that, that bottom layer, parses all of these transactions as updates, constructs, the name database in the virtual chain layer. And the name database has three columns. The actual domain name that's referring to the identity or the asset. The crypto address, which represents the key or set of keys that own the identity. And then the zone file hash. And that zone file hash is, if you guys are familiar with DNS, in the domain name system, uh, there is a file that has all of the uh, C names and uh, A records that allow you to resolve a name to uh, the locations of servers, right? And so in Blockstack, we're using the same exact format that the tra traditional DNS system uses so that uh, it's compatible and you can have existing DNS resolvers work with Blockstack. But so the way that the, way that the actual system works is uh, if you're going to Let's say you're going to uh, create a, a record, right? Whether it's for, let's say the record is a person's identity and you want to associate information with that person. You want to create a profile for them. So what you would actually do is put that information in, uh, in the storage layer, right? The, all of the, whether it's represented, let's say it's represented as JSON, right? All that information would go in the storage layer. You can store it on Amazon S3, you can store it on IPFS, uh, Azure, you can put it on your own personal drive, right? Then you take that location you represent it as a URI, and you put the URI into a zone file, right? And you can have multiple locate, you can link to multiple URIs or whatever. And then that zone file is hashed, and in the routing layer, there's the zone file database where if you give, okay, if you're given a hash, then you can look up the zone file from it. And then, of course, the zone file hash is put into the virtual chain layer, and that, that's encoded in the blockchain. So you can see how there's a separation of layers to make sure that, um, that each component, each component has a certain job that it's a certain thing that's really good with, uh, good at. So um, we're ensuring that you can separate these concerns so that the system can scale, so that the system uh, actually operates very smoothly, right? So you don't want to put all the data in in the layers below. You want to put as much data as possible in the storage layer and use the blockchain for consensus. Uh, and then, and then you have the middle components in between. Um, this is just a quick overview of how the virtual chain is derived from the blockchain. I'm not going to go too deep into that because um, I kind of uh, already covered it. Um, and you can also see these uh, you can also see these diagrams and a more in-depth description on blockstack.org if you're curious on, on how it actually works. Um, and this is just an example of how you would build a uh, the database of name to public key to hash mappings that Blockstack constructs. And uh, a few other uh, pieces of information. So uh, the Blockstack network that's operating on Bitcoin today is also the uh, largest protocol by the number of transactions. Uh, and so you can check this out. This is on opreturn.org. And uh, so we've been operating the Blockstack network for uh, about a year now. and. Um, and we've previously operated on another, on another blockchain. So we've uh, had a couple of years of experience uh, operating a decentralized uh, system like this. Uh, and so this is what all of these experiences actually informed the design that I'm uh, describing to you today, right? 
and uh, that's basically it. So um, if you guys are interested in actually checking out, we're going to see some more demos later about, uh, about I'll show you the Blockstack desktop application. Uh, and then you'll also get to see uh, we're working with uh, Consensus and Uport. Um, we actually have, there's some standards that uh, we've published that you guys can check out on uh, github.com slash Blockstack that are for the profile information and, and how that information is encoded. Uh, and so, um, so these multiple clients can all speak the same protocol for encoding identity information and then um, you'll get to see a, a demo of uh, two identity applications later that use the same uh, block stack protocol. So um, thank you guys very much and uh, we'll continue on to the other demos. <laughs> repeat that, uh, we'll have a break. It may be better to just bring in another talk. So after me, we'll do one more talk and then a break of five minutes. And uh, after the break, we'll have three more talks. So uh, it'll be good. All right. Okay. We can, we can have, we can, but you can do, do you want to do the yeah, we can do one of them. We'll see. All right. Uh, so last I oh, there's. Hmm. Nope. Yeah, maybe. Uh, no, I'm using the right one, I think. Oh, there we go. Yeah, yeah. Sweet. Thank you. Uh, all right. Last. Uh, we were talking about IPLD, which is the core data format for IPFS. Uh, we sort of think of it as a thin waste for data structures, for like authenticated data structures or um, systems that move around Merkle-linked stuff. Uh, the thin waste analogy comes from IP. Uh, if you have seen a diagram of TCP IP and the history of the development of TCP IP, uh, you may have seen a diagram with, I should have it here, with a thin waste where IP is the center and the idea is that the layers on the bottom, things like Ethernet and Wi-Fi and other kinds of radio can evolve on their own and all use their own addressing schemes. And on top of that, you, you agree on one standard uh, for all of them and that standard will be the way you address across networks and that's where the internetwork protocol comes from. Uh, and then on top of that, you layer other things like transports and more sophisticated protocols like TCP or UDP or QUIC or SHTP or whatever, and on top of that, your application. So a thin waste is the, the idea is that by agreeing on one standard, uh, the things on the bottom can evolve on their own and, and you unlock all this innovation there uh, to support any kind of application on top. And the applications on the top can leverage every new kind of transport, right? Because before IP, you would have to design your application and build it against a network specific uh, protocol like on Ethernet, and then the same application would have to be built against, uh, you know, some other protocol like Wi-Fi wasn't around then, but you know, some equivalent. And so the IP protocol was a really nice way of separating concerns. And we take the same idea here and say, what if we had a whole bunch of really nice peer-to-peer -peer protocols for addressing, uh, for, for finding the, the data on the network, for getting connectivity and so on. Um, you know, you can use DHDs, you can use local DNS to find each other, you can use many different kinds of transports underneath. Um, and then if we agree on what the data representation can be, then we can build all sorts of applications on top. We can build things like uh, BitTorrent. You can build things like Git. You can build, build things like uh, 
entire blockchains, you can build websites and so on, all on top of this IPLD thing, and it'll leverage whatever peer-to-peer -peer protocol you put underneath. Uh, so that's where the uh, thin waste analogy comes from. And so we see this as sort of a, an internet of data or an internet of data structures. Uh, and so uh, what we're, with the IPFS project trying to do is, is say, instead of having these massive um, web applications that require this huge behemoth of, of um, you know, web infrastructure to run them, at the, end, at the end of the day, all of these massive applications that, that you use uh, have infrastructure that looks like this, right? With tons of machines uh, hosting web servers and tons of machines hosting application servers and a whole bunch of databases and so on. But all you're really doing through all of this is just manipulating some data structure somewhere, right? Like there's some data structure that represents your user or your messages and so on and is getting manipulated according to the operations you're carrying out. Uh, and many times you have a similar set of operations going on in, in your phone or in your local machine or something, and you have to sync everything to, to the cloud. Um, so I mentioned Bitcoin earlier, and I think Bitcoin reminded us that there were much better ways of doing these kinds of things, and it kind of kick-started again uh, the peer-to-peer -peer innovation that was brought to a halt for a while. Not really to a halt, but it, it kind of went dormant for a bit. A lot of pr people were still um, working on amazing protocols, but the focus uh, of the entire industry wasn't there. And I think Bitcoin woke up everyone again and said, hey, uh, we can do things better. We don't require the cloud as much. We don't um, have to put all of your computation uh, mediated by some third party in the, in the center of the network. Uh, and so we sort of see uh, the web as you know, transitioning from, you know, the beginning it was all about just getting content to be online on top of the internet and accessible so that you could create references to content and find it and fetch it. Uh, web 2.0 was a sort of uh, adding of programs and making programs addressable uh, so that when you were using the web, you could have a dynamic application where you could add content or you know, have things like Facebook and Twitter and so on, um, where you could create uh, content uh, and trigger programs to run. Uh, and uh, this is my conception here, uh, totally uh, different perspective. I'm sure m many people will tell you a different different story, but what I think the next phase of the web, like Web 3.0, if we can call it that, would be, is that there's an inversion going on where we're no longer being mediated by specific computers, right? So IPFS lifts the data from the from the specific host that is located because it's addressing things with content addressing, with hashes. And so now you can link content to other content. Uh, Bitcoin and Ethereum uh, similarly are linking content to content in transactions to other transactions. Uh, and they're also uh, making the, the programs verifiable so that you no longer have to trust the computer on the other side. You don't have to, to trust the brand of the, of the web application or the web of the developers of that web application. Uh, so that way, uh, you can run the computation yourself and verify it. Other people can do it as well. And over time, the organizations can shift, but the data remains the same, right? So you don't, you know, you don't need to trust the specific miners that are mining uh, the Ethereum chain, for example. Uh, they can, they're replaceable. And so this is, uh, I think, the, when you zoom out, the, the fundamental difference here, that content is getting linked to content, and programs are getting linked to other programs directly, and they're publicly verifiable. Uh, so when you think about web application data, uh, as we were saying, there's some data structure somewhere, and you're really just manipulating some objects. Uh, so that's just a graph, right? Like it's just some gra large graph of objects. Uh, so we're already doing stuff like this, but what if we could do things like just sign uh, some updates um, and be able to know that, that this was actually done by me, like this, that these changes were actually, um, uh, this is a change that I actually wanted to do. Uh, so today we have to trust some web application server or the, or the mobile, you have to trust all these pieces of software in between. Uh, but it'd be really nice uh, if we could just create data and sign it with some local key and then leave it, give it to the network. Um, and when I give you a reference to it, you can check it, you can check that the signature is fine, and now you know that it was really uh, created by me. Kind of how PGP works, right? Uh, and how Bitcoin works and, and all these other systems. So this is where, where IPLD comes in. What if we structure the data through this, these Merkle links? And so that way you can just look at the, at the root of something and sign that. Uh, and you can verify, like, that you can add, attach a signature to that root, which 
by definition also signs the rest of the of the of the structure, right? And because you are linking, you're Merkle linking things, then you get uh, all the benefits of being able to cache things, being able to move them, they're immutable, and all that nice Merkle goodness. Um, instead of a web where all of the things, all of the links point to some location somewhere, we're thinking more of like creating like a secure mesh. Like think of like, a, and also don't think of just a blockchain. You can think of all kinds of data structures floating in this in this network, right? Um, version control histories, uh, yeah, blockchains, uh, data structures that represent some large index on a file system or some data set or real time data that's that's just being generated about you know by some sensor somewhere, uh, and all of that can be certified along the way. Uh, so the I mentioned Merkle links. Uh, if you just to give a really quick analogy about why Merkle linking is really nice, uh, in the good old days we had CVS and, and SVN, right? And th those systems uh, had were pretty uh, annoying because if you got disconnected from the back from the actual servers that, that you uh, were talking to, then uh, you were you could not work, right? You had to submit your your changes to that one central central system. Uh, it, likewise, if that central system uh, fell apart, then you could not work at all. And so Git said, hey, why don't we just do distributed version control where you can send up this to each other? And Git wasn't the first system to do this. There were others like Monotone and Fossil um, and probably others as well. But uh, Git had this idea of saying, hey, what if we send up this to, to anybody and we can do so in a, in a verifiable way with hashing? Uh, and so if you get disconnected from the network, you can still operate, if you get if the servers go down, you can still work locally and, and ship your updates to each other. And uh, this is what IPFS is doing, but for all websites, right? We call this hyperspeed because it allows you to cheat the speed of light, because if you already have content, you never have to request it again. Uh, or if you have content around in the same room, you never have to go to the back one. Uh, and so yeah, this is what powers get and so on as we talk about all these other structures. They're all Merkle links. Woo. So, uh, uh, yeah, like this is the addressing model of IPFS. You have this this address where you have some hash and, and you can structure data. Uh, so the thing about IPLD that's cool, and I just wanted to show you, we want a quick example, and I know I'm going a little bit over time, uh, but uh, I just wanted to show you this. Uh, the cool thing about IPLD is that it's a Merkle linked, you can think of it like Merkle linked JSON. And so, the thin waste Merkle DAG protocol, right? So let's take all these Merkle graphs and link them together with one standard. And so uh, think of the JSON data model and then serialize it into a nice binary packed object, not just stringified JSON, but something nicer like, like binary JSON or CBOR, uh, where we happen to be using CBOR. Uh, so take that nice data model that everyone's familiar with and say, when you link from one object to another, It'd be nice if you could use links that are hashes, uh, because now you get all that Merkle linked goodness, right? If you have some data structure in a web application, as JSON, and you link with a hash, now you get that verifiability. And it'd be nice to be able to path through it and explore it with paths, with like JSON path and that kind of thing. But it'd be nice to be able to resolve through those those links, right? So imagine you have one JSON object, and in there you link with a hash to some other JSON object, and in there you link with a hash from some other JSON object, and so on down. And it'd be really nice to be able to use a pathing system, just like you would in a file system, to access all of the data in that JSON data structure and the ones it links to. So in a way, it's like taking one massive JSON data structure of all available possible data and then sharding it with and hashing with Merkle links. I don't know if that made sense to other people, but that's kind of how it makes sense to me. Uh, because you can really access any kind of data this way, right? So you can take whatever data, data you have, turn the links into hashes, and now you have the ability to transparently traverse through all of it. Uh, so yeah, this is the, the, the heart of, of IPFS. You can structure data, like for example, like this is, um, this is not super updated. These examples are not uh, the latest version. But uh, I'll just walk you through one super quick example here. So I have some files. Let me increase the font size. Not this example. Show this example. Suppose that we have a very dumb IPFS. We have this mock IPFS, which is really just 
a JavaScript dictionary that you can put stuff to and you can get stuff from out. Uh, it just gives you IPFS put and IPFS get. And you have a, some files, right? So imagine that we have a file and the data is, hey, I'm subfile one. And you have a second file and it's like, hey, I'm subfile two. And here's a subfile three that's actually the combination of some other files. This is, you know, I'm subfile three and some other data. Uh, we can, to help visualize the order, actually will get generated this way. Uh, and so what we're doing here is that we're creating links. So this files object uh, is creating links. It's using links to these other files over here with based on the hash, right? So we take subfile one and we IP, call IPFS put on that, which right now is just storing it into a dictionary, but you can imagine that being a distributed system that does all sorts of crazy stuff. Uh, and we're taking the hash of that and we are also putting some second file and we're taking those two hashes and linking them in into the third file. So now the third file is linking through to these other subfiles. Um, and so you can represent a larger file by, as the concatenation of these other subfiles, right? Uh, you can do directories the same way. You can have a directory where the files are just, you know, some, the name of the file and you're linking to the actual file that, that you want to see. And so, you know, you can, you can think about how you would implement this and you, like, cat is pretty simple. You just take the key of the file, you ask IPFS to retrieve the content, which is this I IPLD JSON data structure, and you say, great, I'm going to take that data field and consider it as the beginning of my file, uh, and then I'm going to iterate over whatever other files I find there, so these, and I'm just going to recurse and say, great, go and fetch, go and cat whatever this file is and append it to the to the next part, right? And so if we were to, so this the slash here is uh, how we define a Merkle link, right? So um, let's let's console log this out. So let's let's actually like So at the beginning, it's the actual, this is what the, the file represents in JSON-LD. Sorry, in, sorry, in just JSON. Um, and this is what the, the actual hash of it is, uh, what we define as the key. This is a multi-hash. So this is a, a, a SHA-256 hash, but you can, this is the, multi-hash is the format that we use to abstract out whichever hash function you want to use, right? So you, you might want to use SHA-256, you may want to use SHA-512. You may want to use Blake 2. You may want to use you know some other some other thing. Uh, <laughs> love Blake 2. Thank you. Thank you so much. Like really, it's it's so nice and fast. Um, cool. So uh, yeah, uh, we can do the same thing for file two and so on, right? And so if we were to look at what file three looks like. So this is what, what file three looks like, right? It's just, hey, I'm subfile three, and it has some links to another file, right? And you can see that this link is the same because we're linking to the same file twice. Uh, so what, what, are we, what would you expect to see there? The slash is defining a link. Um, so the, the, what the slash is saying is it's a special way that we define how one IPLD object is going to link to another IPLD object. Uh, in a sense, it's saying, imagine inlining. So if you could inline in JSON um, in a secure way, you're, you're creating a link from one JSON object to another JSON object. And that link is the address, uh, it's the hash of, of the other object. Does that kind of make sense? Yeah. Uh, not here. This is just an identifier that we use to say, um, you know, if, if you were to say, uh, you know, some, some, if you had like some big hash or something and you said slash data, then you would get, what you would get back out is just I'm subfile three. And if you did slash files, what you would get back is this array. And if you did slash files slash zero, what you would get is, you wouldn't get this dictionary. What you would get is the represent, it would resolve through that hash to get the, the, what that represents. Does that kind of make sense? Yeah. Uh, 
Yeah, so here that slash is just an identifier. So you can't put, you know, slash foo or something there. Yep. And down the rabbit hole we go, what about circular links? What about what? Circular links. So Merkle linking does not allow you to do cyclical links by definition. My, yeah, so in a file system you could link that way. So you can layer mutable links on top of this, for sure. Yeah, <laughs> finding, finding a cycle in, in Merkle links is the same thing as finding a hash collision. So, good luck. Uh, yeah. Can you repeat the question for the screen? So the question is, uh, if I got you correctly, is is it up to the user uh, to decide when to inline and when to, to actually traverse through uh, or to just get the, the actual value? So if you, you can have some functions that will transparently resolve through for you, but of course, if you just have access to the raw data, you can decide what to do, right? So if you just pull out one object, um, this is kind of like a mock example, but this is what IPFS is doing behind the scenes. Uh, you can pull out the single object and inspect the link and retrieve the link and use that. I, I, was, I was thinking about the other way. So when I'm creating these data structures, mm -hmm. am I required to put a link for each of the arrays, or can I just put the array in the... So basically, is Seabor always a valid IP LD or so is Seabor always a valid IP LD or for each nesting you you absolutely must use Oh no you can, you can create whatever data structure you want and only like you can take just any valid Seabor object and import it and that's IP LD it just doesn't have any links uh, and you can add links wherever you want to add links Okay that was Does that make sense thank you yep yeah, so uh, just to explain to the other uh, people what that question meant is what if you had some more complicated data structure, right? So what if files, uh, subfile so three really had some metadata, right? Like saying, you know, notes, right? And like you could add notes to your file in a secret place and say, hey, foo, bar over here, right? Or something. So that's totally fine. Um, and so IPLD allows you to define things however you want. You, you can have whatever data structure you want. Yep. Ah, there we go. Um, yeah, so, so you showed here this is a way to take a big file and, and kind of make it more manageable. Mm -hmm. is, is there like a maximum, I mean, you can create an arbitrarily big um, IPLD object, right? And so, but when you want to push it over the network, it's nicer if it's in that form. So, so how does that work? Yeah. So, what IPFS does right now um, is that it, you know, it has some like object limit, right? So, IPFS imposes that object limit on top and says, "Hey, your serialized IPLD object should be of a maximum of a certain size." Um, but that's really up to the implementation, right? So an, another implementation could say, no, 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 we want to support larger sizes because maybe our networks are faster or we're not going as far. Um, I think that whatever that chunk size is, is very much a time and network dependent thing, right? So today we might think that a megabyte is like the max or maybe 256 kilobytes is the max. But in 10 years we might think, no, really like it's kind of annoying to have to shard so small. What if? 16 megabytes is the max or something. Uh, if you're if you're using raw IPLD, you can do whatever you want, and your application can can choose what that size might be. You can have some very large, complicated data structure. Another interesting thing about this is that you can start because all we're really doing here is representing objects with a graph, right? So there's some section of the graph that is one IP, JSON object or Seabor object that's linking through to no, some other subgraph and so on. And we're using these Merkle links to sort of join the graph and inline it with securely with a hash, immutably, forever. Um, oh, man. Uh, so uh, you could define operations. So if you, if you start thinking about functional data structures, which is this is what this is, really, um, if you start thinking about functional data structures, you can define transformations over these graphs. And you can take one graph and produce another graph. And you can take that transformation and encode it and think of it as one other IPLD object. And you can have another IPLD object that points to one huge graph that also points to the code you're going to run. And now you can have transformations embedded in your file system. So 
at some point in the past in this room, I demoed a thing that I was calling like JSFS, which means that uh, I just store some J JavaScript somewhere, and then on pulling it out, on catting a file, what I'm doing is I'm running the JavaScript to, pr to produce the output. You can start doing that, and so start running transformation functions on the data. This is really malleable, right? Because then you can start doing representing all sorts of stuff. Um, and it fits really nicely with all the functional computing uh, and, and functional languages and functional data structures world. Um, so in a way, Merkle-linked stuff is really just functional data structures, uh, but in a way that you can use them in a distributed system securely, because you can check the hashes all the way. Uh, did that kind of make sense to people, sort of? All right. Uh, the last thing I wanted to show is just how this actually does do what, as advertised. Um, oh man, it doesn't do what's advertised. What did I break? Ooh, file one hash not defined. File one hash not defined. Oh man. Ah, yeah, here. Let's just remove these. These were dumb. So uh, we can print out what file three is. Um, so that it just files cat on file three. And so it's just piecing it all together, right? Uh, if that was too fast on people, I'll do it. Here's file one. Hey, I'm file one. Here's file two. And here's file three which is the concatenation, it's, it's grabbing the first data field and then, so it's taking the, that first object, pulling it out, looking at the data field and then looking at the files links and then resolving through those, uh, fetching them from IPFS uh, and then concatenating them and outputting them. Make sense? Cool. But you can do this for all kinds of data structures, right? And like that's the secret of, that's the magic behind IPFS is that it allows you to do these kinds of things. And IPFS is not about POSIX files. It's really just about data. It's about any kind of data structures that you generate. Um, you can represent blockchains the same way. Uh, you can create like a block that points to some other block and points to transactions and points to addresses and, and all that kind of stuff and create one huge, huge data structure. All right, thank you. I'm gonna pass it off to other people. Uh, how are we feeling? Do you want one more talk now or a break? All right, let's, someone said break. Let's break for five minutes and come back. Uh, drinks, drinks on us on the back. Welcome back. Next up is uh, Ligi talking about IPFS on Android. <laughs> Go for it. Hey. Can everyone hear me? Wonderful. I will uh, just give a short lightning talk update on uh, IPFS for Android. Uh, as a context, because not all of you have been here at the last IPFS meetup, I will give a short um, context why the whole thing. Um, I'm an Android developer who loves decentralization in IPFS, uh, and I could not wait anymore to do content addressing uh, and skip the whole location addressing. But there was no IPFS app for Android yet, um, so I had to start that. Um, the concept is to use a centralized service first, the IPFS.io, and replace it with a real IPFS node later, but this uh, information is kind of outdated because we have a real IPFS node already now in there. Um, and in between, there is then time um, to, to play with the UX patterns and uh, play with IPFS on mobile, basically. Um, this is basically the start. So it, it has intent filters um, for FS IPFS and FS IPNS. And now we already have a node running here uh, and can issue certain like commands and upload content to, to IPFS, for example, um, text content. And add it here. And then we get the hash here. And then we can cat it on another device like that. Yeah. Uh, and the same also works for other applications, like um, let's, for example, use the camera. and make some stupid picture here. Bum. Then we go to the, it's the same, um, is a send intent. The content is added. 
you can also like copy the clipboard here, but uh, the emulator has a different clipboard um, than my computer. And then this image. Yeah, and it's okay. I think. So then the image is on another computer on IPFS. So we have the content basically there. Uh, yeah. So the next steps for that, um, yeah, use real IPFS implementation. We do that now already. End of the year, we need like uh, at the moment it's not really usable because it works, but it uses like a lot of CPU, a lot of bandwidth. Uh, but they will solve it. They promised me. <laughs> um, and then a content provider, so that other apps basically can talk to the IPFS node and fetch content through that. Um, a document provider for the other way around, so basically um, uh, apps can pick content. And a small Android library that's really easy to just drop in an Android library to your project, and then you. Can and do content addressing. Um, because there are really interesting applications for mobile, like a decentralized app store, I really want to have that. A map tile hosting, like for example, here's one uh, developer like who has a big Android app um, and he was going to OpenStreetMap and saying, hey, I want to use OpenStreetMap and they were saying, are you mad? <laughs> uh, you will crash our servers and uh, doing it on IPFS would be just awesome. You know, you don't uh, have to ask OpenStreetMap, you just get the tiles from IPFS and I personally want to use that for hosting SPAS file at the moment. Uh, follow up, uh, the code is um, on GitHub. It's a special branch now because um, after the last uh, hack and tell, I had a nice hacking session with Seb and we uh, switched um, the cross compiling of Go basically and it's in a separate branch right now. Uh, just contact me if you have any questions and that's basically it. That's awesome, really great work. Uh, next up is Suku. Um, yeah. Oh, you still tell it to me. So it's a huge honor to have Zuko with us. Uh, Zuko is a creator of the Tahoe LAFS project and the Zcash project. Um, Tahoe LAFS in so many ways is like a, a parent to IPFS. It developed a lot of the ideas that went into using Merkle trees for file systems and all that kind of stuff. So we share a lot of genealogy and a lot of amazing ideas uh, came from Tahoe LAFS. Especially an awesome capability system. But So thank you for uh, hanging out. Thanks. Okay, I'm gonna, I started my timer so I can see how much time I have. I figure I should take about 15 minutes. Oh shoot, it's a German keyboard layout. Okay. Thank you. Um, so I have two completely different things I wanna talk about. One is Tahoe LFS, which um, like you just heard is a lot like IPFS, and the other thing, why am I, I can't web. And the other thing I want to talk about is Zcash, which is a lot like BitTorrent, a uh, Bitcoin. It's not like BitTorrent at all. Um, and uh, the, the difference, both of these things, a, sub a significant part about them is that they have more encryption for privacy. So, of the 14 minutes that remain, how many people want to hear more about Zcash? Raise your hand. And how many people want to hear more about Tahoe LAFS? Whoa, there's only like, oh yeah, okay, good. So, all right. So starting with Zcash, that's uh, the new thing that I'm spending most of my time on. It's, um, yeah, it's a cryptocurrency. We took Bitcoin and um, uh, added, uh, layer of cryptography. Uh, there's this um, cryptographic protocol. Wait, how many? It seems like from the questions, people really are more interested in like encryption algorithms and bits and data structures and details around here, right? So um, there was a 
crypto algorithm designed by a bunch of scientists um, called Zero Cash. And we took that, and those scientists are all part of the Zcash team too. And um, so you can find this paper and find out all the details, but the main reason I want this paper here is to show figure one. With figure one, I can remember all the details. Um, So what we've done is add one um, new type of transaction to the Bitcoin protocol, and we're going to launch a separate blockchain. Right now, there's um, there's a testnet running, and you can get the source code. And just like about five minutes ago, we released the latest alpha release of the of the source code. Yeah. And um, this is the diagram for, if we want to talk about all the details about the crypto algorithm, but the effect of it is, uh, is that, um, so I, I think of Bitcoin as basically a, a, an append only ledger and the entries in the ledger are sender address, recipient address and value transferred. And at first people thought that since the address is just a random or a it says the address doesn't have your name written into it, that that made Bitcoin private. And that reminds me of how when, uh, when the internet was new, which I also remember because I'm that old, uh, since IPv4 addresses don't have your name in them, then that, people thought that made the internet private. That's, um, and it takes a bit more than that, right? So, uh, and there's lots of other techniques for adding privacy to Bitcoin, but this one is um, the, the, the zero cash protocol, which we call Zcash now, is the one that lets you put transfers of assets into a shared public ledger while revealing almost the minimum information that you could possibly put into the public ledger using cryptography. Um, so that's what distinguishes it from other privacy techniques like uh, mixing is a typical way you could take Bitcoin and combine multiple transactions, but that would still leave a lot of information in the ledger about which transactions weren't part of that, you know. Um, with this, uh, there's, uh, you can append to the shared ledger an encrypted sender address, encrypted recipient address, and encrypted value. Uh, so that, you guys are all staring at this trying to figure out what this means, aren't you? So that, um, so that nobody who's not privy to the decryption can see anything about the sender address, recipient address, or value. Um, so there's, there's practically no information. The only information that gets leaked into the ledger is uh, the timing. Let me see. I think it's mostly just the timing of when that got added and um, certain, certain information about what the current state of the blockchain was, like the most recent block when you generated that transaction. I think that's almost the only information that gets leaked at all into the blockchain. So it's sort of cryptographically the most private um, you can ha you can have. Um, well, that's already been five minutes. I'll just switch tracks and talk about Tahoe for a minute. So Tahoe is awesome. It's nine years old, huh? Yeah. Well, actually, we're gonna we can hang around and chat after um, Ryan. Ryan's gonna give one talk after this, and then that's the last of the scheduled talks. Oh, sorry. Okay. And so there's two more talks after this, but I can talk about Zcash or Tahoe all night. So. Find me afterward. Um, Tahoe is nine years old now, uh, and we've put out 20 stable releases. The most recent one was March. Um, it was really interesting to listen to Juan's description of IPLD, linked data. Um, there's a, the, the, the core concept that that Juan got from um, Git, I guess, and which you also see in BitTorrent, is using the secure hash of some data to be the link to it. And that makes, it, that makes the relationship between the link and the data immutable. And in Tahoe, we did that, and we also did one other thing that I really like, and so far I, I haven't seen anyone else adopt it. We didn't invent it, it, it was also done in Freenet, um, and uh, in David Mazier's secure file system, which 
one also learned from. But that is, but I, I want to prom promulgate this notion. Using the secure hash as the link makes an immutable mapping from link to data, and that's cool and very useful. Now, using a public key as the link makes an unforgeable but mutable mapping from the link to the data. Yep. <laughs> so, uh, so I think that's, uh, so what we have in Tahoe now is um, two types of links, mutable and immutable, and of course you can always build more data structures with different access control properties and stuff like that on top of things, but, um, but I really like the idea of the link itself having the public key, or at least a secure hash of the public key, uh, in the link. And that, I really like the idea of that public key being specific to that data object, so that, um, so that you can share access to one data object without thereby sharing access to other data objects, so it's fine-grained. Um, and that sounds a little bit crazy at first blush to have that many public keys, like one public key for every single object, uh, but you already have a pointer or a link for every object, right? You always link to objects. So like the only time you ever access data without linking to it is when you're like scraping the data off of your broken hard drive and looking at the bits, trying to figure out where your file is. That's the only time you're ever not going through a link. So um, since we're always going through links, you can put in uh, a public key into every link and it doesn't induce a great key management problem. Um, and there's something else you can do. You can go ahead and put an encryption key into the link while you're at it. And that's something else we've done in Tahoe. And so um, that means that in Tahoe, every object is encrypted, always. There's no publishing uh, unencrypted objects in Tahoe. Uh, but every time you follow a link, it automatically decrypts because you got the decryption key when you got the link. Um, so, in my opinion, it works nearly as well or about as well uh, for public data. Anyway, even though every object is encrypted, if you publish the link to that data, uh, you know, to the world on the web or Web 3.0 or whatever, uh, the world will be able to read it. Uh, but if, you know, you publish it to a large but non-universal group, then that also works. So those are the two things that I want everyone to learn from the Tahoe um, design. Okay, that's 10 minutes, so now I have five more minutes to talk about Zcash. Um, Yeah. Yeah, I could I could tell some things about Zcash. We intend to launch it in September. We have this um, roadmap, which is our our GitHub milestones page. And ah, all right. so go to GitHub if you want to see how we're doing. Some things on this roadmap are late, of course, but I still think this one that's nine days late is the one that we just released 10, 15 minutes ago. Um, but I, th I think we're still going to successfully launch the 1.0, the Genesis block in September. Uh, so there's going to be this new blockchain. Um, the s important difference about it is that it's possible to add encrypted transactions. Um, encrypted transactions cause there to be selective transparency, not all secret all the time. So Bitcoin is all transparent all the time. And the n uh, n natural mistake people tend to make when they hear about Zcash for the first time is to think that Zcash is all secret all the time. It's like the dark, the dark Bitcoin. Uh, but that's not it at all. Um, because encryption is a thing that you can selectively decrypt. Uh, so you can always, <clears throat> You can always reveal your decryption keys to selected, like intentionally chosen third parties, and that allows them to see the, that transaction. Um, and like with Tahoe, we make we, we make we try to make each key have as fine a grain as a user could plausibly want to control. So every key in Zcash just decrypts that one transaction. So um, you can use it, for example, for private proof of purchase if you. Uh, paid someone for something 
and you didn't choose to do it in the public way that everyone on the blockchain could see that the transaction happened. Instead, you made a private payment to someone. And then there's some dispute or they didn't realize that you paid them. You can uh, send to them or to anyone else the decryption key, which allows that person to see your, that transaction in the blockchain. Um, so I think that's very, very interesting, actually, because um, Bitcoin, was, Bit, Bitcoin was conceived as digital cash, but it's really interesting that it has an append-only uh, canonical database in it, right? A lot of potentially interesting uses, such as um, the naming system that Ryan was talking about, Blockstack. Um, so Zcash is, I think, kind of a generalization of that. There's still a single source of truth, but it doesn't have to be that everyone can see the whole contents of the database at once. You can have different subsets of the database that are visible to different people. Um, but if you do reveal some, a part of the contents to a person, they can know that what they're looking at is the one true only record in the, the one true database. That's a really interesting property. Okay, questions? So, uh, is it publicly auditable to anyone? You want this one? Where's the, the other mic? The question was, is it publicly auditable to anyone? So, what do you mean by auditable? Wait, give him the mic. Uh, that everybody can verify whether the transactions actually uh, followed some uh, properties such as that no no money was created or okay no, the answer is that like got that. the question the answer is right so all the so the transactions encrypted the sender address recipient address and value is encrypted and no one can see it so then people would be able to uh, cheat by inventing money or double spending so that's why we have zero knowledge proofs this is, the, as far as I know, the first actual use of zero knowledge proofs for anything that anyone really cares about in the real world. Um, and zero knowledge proofs are this awesome, mind-boggling crypto that was invented like 30 years ago about. Um, so there's a zero knowledge proof. So the, the, the ledger is encrypted sender address, encrypted recipient address, encrypted value, and zero knowledge proof that the sender had at least that much money and hasn't double spent it. Nice. Question. Hi. Yeah. Thanks for your talk. Um, I might actually be repeating the last question, but mm. uh, uh, please excuse my ignorance when I say, how within such a system do you get a trust convergence, or is it entirely separate, not like Bitcoin at all? Again. Yeah, I think that's kind of the same question. So, if yeah. you believe in the in the cryptography of zero knowledge proofs, that each of those transactions comes with this crypto string. And all of the miners and full nodes verify this thing, which, which convinces us, according to our current understanding of cryptography, that nobody could have come up with that crypto string unless they controlled enough money to cover this transaction and they hadn't spent that money to anyone else in any earlier transaction. So, that, that, so we're relying on the zero knowledge proof of that in order to make everyone agree. So if someone pays you, and they say, here's some Zcash. And you wonder, is everyone else in the world also going to agree that it's mine now? Everyone else in the world is going to agree because they're all relying on the zero, assuming if they, re if they believe in zero knowledge proofs, then they're going <laughs> to rely on uh, the zero knowledge proofs that that money was legitimately mined originally, way back in history, and has only been spent at most once on each hop until it got to you. Um, maybe a bit more, maybe I can find the answer myself, but it's, as you're here, um, can you get like statistical analysis from, from the chain? So basically the same question, but differently formulated, like get you, do you get to choose your private key um, for a fixed address? So if I'm spending from one address several times, can I obfuscate that? To, with, with a different private key, or is there still information leaking in, in a statistical sense? If I would do many transactions, could that be derived? Um, I'm not exactly sure what you mean by a statistical sense. Do you mean like well, even if the attacker had infinite computing power and could break our 
Crypto no, for example, oh, okay, say that we would be trading a lot back no, and forth. I got forth. you then. No, I know what you mean. Yes, yeah, so crypt cryptography is used the word statistical to mean something else about information theory. But what you're saying is if you use the same public key or the same address, right? So it, it, Zcash has addresses the same as Bitcoin has, which is basically derived from a public key kind of. Uh, so if you use the same address multiple times to send so from the same wallet, um, the answer is the um, for sending, nobody gets to see um, any information about which sending address it came from. Uh, you, you might want to reveal that to the recipient if you want to use your public, your address is your wallet address as the way to communicate to the recipient. Or you could instead just tell them like your account with them or your account number with them or something else. Um, for receiving, nobody on the in the world gets to see anything about the receiving address except the sender gets got to see which receiving address he sent to, right? So if you give if you use the same address and give it to multiple people, they might, if they compare notes with one another, they might realize they're both paying to the same address. Okay. Okay, but that's the extent of the information that is available to anyone. Now uh, I want to answer a lot more questions, but we should give Ryan and Christian. Is it Christian? Yeah, a chance to talk. And then maybe you could find me afterwards, or if you all keep sitting here afterwards, I could stand up in front of you again afterwards. Uh, Z.cash and TahoeLaughs.org. Thank you very much. Everyone again? All right, let's see. Is there an issue with that? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Cool. All right. So I'm gonna demo two things real quick to you guys. Um, so before we were talking about Blockstack and um, how there's the Blockstack network, and then there's clients that are built on top of it where you can interact with the network, and you can register records and identities for people and assets and so on. Uh, and one of these, one of the interfaces that you can use to do so is the command line interface uh, that we have. And uh, I'll give you a quick demo of that. And then after that, uh, the, I'll show you the other interface, which is a graphical user interface, um, which is our desktop application that we're going to be coming out with soon. So, but first the the command line interface. So, um, I can walk you through some of the commands. So, if you type block stack, then you'll get to see. Uh, a list of all of the commands, right, that Blockstack provides. Uh, you can, um, first thing you can do is do Blockstack info. And, hold on, oh, there we go, okay. So with Blockstack info, it'll show you the versions, it'll show you uh, the actual, ser so there's a, when you use a client, right, it's going to connect to a particular Blockstack server. So we talked about before how uh, the individual servers, they connect to nodes in the Bitcoin network or nodes in, um, because it's blockchain agnostic, it could be nodes in another blockchain network, right? But so it connects to a node and then it uh, develops its local database of names and public keys. And this command line interface is connecting to a Blockstack server and in this, um, in the output, it's showing you the server that it's connecting to, right? Um, and the next thing I can do is uh, do block stack names, and it'll show me all the names that I'm that I own locally on this uh, with this uh, command line interface. Uh, it looks like I don't own any names, but if I register names, then they'll eventually show up, and then I can uh, interact with them and and work with them. Uh, and if I do block stack balance, then it'll show that I have a certain balance of Bitcoin. So right here I have about 0 0.01 Bitcoin, and that's about like $5, right? 
So I have some money that I can use to register these records on the network. And every time I do an operation, then it'll deduct from my balance, it'll use it to uh, send a transaction and pay the transaction fee, and then it'll also pay, it'll burn some additional money, which is like a sacrifice um, based on the cost of the name that's going to be registered, right? Uh, then the next thing I can do is I can, um, I can, you, you guys might be familiar with who is, right? So I can do a who is operation on a particular name. And um, here I'm going to do who is on munib.id, which means it's the name, the username or the domain name munib that has been registered. Yeah, this Munib's uh, my co founder of Blockstack Labs, I mentioned before. And uh, it's registered within the .id namespace. So like just like on traditional DNS, there's a .com for that's a particular namespace, there's .org, and so on. On Blockstack, there's a namespace for people called .id. So if I do a who is on that name, then you can see some information. You can see here is the address that owns the name. You can see the public key that corresponds with that address. Uh, you can see the transaction ID uh, in which the name was first pre-ordered. Uh, and then uh, some uh, some other information like when it when the name was actually uh, which block number that the name was pre-ordered uh, and when it was last renewed. And the next thing I can do uh, is actually do a lookup, right? And so I'll look up the information that's associated with munib.id, right? And as you can see here, what just happened is I did this lookup and then I got back a data record. And this data can be anything, it's just bytes. Uh, but in this particular case, it's JSON. And this JSON uh, is, represents a profile. That, and it's, you can see Muneeb's name is Muneeb Ali right here, and he has his Twitter account and some other information that's present here, right? Um, and just one thing to point out, this is actually an old data format, and we've, we're just going through the process of upgrading our data format, and you can, you'll be able to see that soon, uh, where you can see new profiles that are, that are um, represented in a different way. Um, and so uh, the next thing that I can do is, so we just saw how um, with a name we looked up, we looked at the who is information associated with the name, the public key, and then we looked up the data uh, that's associated with the name. By the way, that data is not actually stored in the blockchain, as I referenced before. We had those different layers for Blockstack. Um, the data is actually stored uh, elsewhere, right? The data is stored in cloud storage, and uh, the URI is stored uh, in, a, in the zone file. And like just like in DNS, and so the the hash of the zone file is put in the blockchain. That hash references a file that is stored on all the Blockstack servers, and then that file has a URI that points to cloud storage, which is where the full JSON data and or other formatted data is stored. Right, um, and then the last thing that I can do is actually go and I can do a registration. So I can register a new name like. Um, Ryan June2.id, June right, it's a particular name. And then when I do that and I register it, you'll see that it'll deduct a balance. It'll deduct um, from my balance. And then it'll go broadcast a transaction on the network. And then after waiting for uh, a few blocks, you'll see that the, uh, all of the block stack nodes in the entire network independently will see that new transaction come through. They will add, they will parse that new transaction. They'll update their own local database of names. And then with any of those nodes or any of the clients that connect to them, they will all respond with the same who is information and the same lookup information. And you'll see this name is owned by this address or public key and has, is tagged with this particular data. So that's how it works. I'm not going to show the registration now because it takes a little more time to go through. But the next thing that I'll show is the second uh, client that you should be uh, uh, that you should check out, which is the desktop application. And so um, in, the, in the command line interface, we just went through uh, an interface that is primarily, it's text-based, right? And it's for, um, for programmers to inter interact with. Uh, and the desktop application that we're coming out with soon, which you can see right here, is for, uh, it's for end users and it's for developers to see how, um, to play around with it and see how they interact with it, right? Uh, and so the way this works is very similar to uh, the command line interface, but uh, visual. And so we have personas here, and as you can see, I already have one persona that's been registered. Um, but I can go and I can register another one. So um, I'll do Ryan June 2, and I'll register that. And it'll show up 
uh, in my list of personas. And the idea here is that <clears throat> you can have, um, just like you have different, you can have different profiles on social networks, right? You can have multiple Twitter accounts or whatever, um, and you can have, you have a, you have a, different personas, right, that you use in different contexts of your life. You might have certain things you want to put on your dating profile that you don't want your, your employer to see, or certain things that, you know, you, you, you might put, uh, you, maybe you have um, <clears throat> another um, profile that's used for just for your friends and when you, when you go out, right? Um, so the idea here is it's, it's centered around personas. Um, <clears throat> and then the idea here is so I have my, I have my profile and I can go in and just quickly um, fill out this information. And... Um, and then as I fill it out, then I'll save it. And what's actually happening is this information is getting uploaded to Amazon S3. But I can easily configure it to, um, to go and so it's actually hosted on S3 through Blockstack Labs. But I can also self-host the information if I want um, through S3 and if I put in my own uh, S3 API keys. Right? So the idea there is that users manage their own data. Um, and you can easily put that on IPFS. You can put it on um, your own other Dropbox or some other storage that you want. Uh, and the idea is that the users are in, in charge of, uh, of handling their own data, but there's a default that's provided so that you can get set up really quickly. So um, I started filling out my profile. Uh, I can add a photo, right? And um, whoops. And uh, let's see. And uh, soon you'll be able to do full uploads. But I just um, I just put in my photo, and the next thing I can do is actually add social accounts. So I'll put in my Twitter, and my Twitter's up there. Um, and then I'll put in my Reddit. And, um, and as you see here, these these are actually just regular uh, regular accounts. There's no uh, additional context with it, but if I go to, this is my actual profile that I use, um, you can see that I have three accounts here that are actually verified. So these verified symbols show that I actually, uh, I made a post in that social network and proved that I actually own that account. Um, and then of course, you know, this is not my profile, but I can go and connect with it. And there's a, there's a actual kind of social network uh, built in as well, where, where users can follow each other. And, oh, and here's my Open Bazaar store. Here's my public key. Here's my um, uh, this is my Bitcoin address. Oh, no, this is PD is my PGB key. This is my Bitcoin address. Um, and that's basically it. And and the other th the other thing to uh, think about is, uh, so I just did a registration and I just filled out my profile and I managed it. And the registration just like with the command line interface, pay, uh, triggers a transaction that goes to the Bitcoin network and the name is getting processed. And that's happening independently of the profile management, right, that I am and all the data that I'm uploading to S3 or, or whatever cloud storage provider. And eventually, once the transaction gets processed and once the name is showed up as, as something that I own, then the anyone who has this desktop application or has a command, the command line interface or any other client that operates on Blockstack will independently be able to then look up that my name just like I did or um, and, and will be able to load my profile right on their, on their account. And, and so um, just as an, as an example, I can also search for people, right? I can search for my name. Um, I can search for Albert's name and I can see um, Albert Wanger's profile, is, he's one of our investors. Uh, and uh, so yeah, so you can, uh, the key thing here is that everything is really happening on this desktop application, right? It's a completely um, client-side, peer-to-peer system. And the only server that this relies on is one Blockstack server that I can specify. And I can run my own Blockstack server or I can connect to a, a Blockstack server that I trust. Uh, and, the, and the really key here is that it's a, it it's provides this backbone for decentralized applications to be built. And soon, uh, you'll be able to actually uh, view the, these view applications in this desktop application as well. Um, that, and it, beyond that, we're also going to come out with a authentication protocol. Uh, we have a lot of this stuff um, uh, online at uh, github.com slash blockstack, so you can go and check that out. Uh, we have the authentication protocol, it's open source, it's on there, uh, but we're working on releasing a complete package 
uh, where you know it's just drag and drop JavaScript or or whatever uh, language you use, uh, so that you can integrate the authentication protocol and you can make use of this uh, this decentralized identity naming authentication um, user centric storage protocol. Um, and the idea there is you can build an application where you don't have to worry about user management, you don't have to worry about authentication, you don't have to worry about um, storing your data with your user, right? And you can use, uh, you can plug right into Blockstack and use the authentication system, and you can build apps faster and in a more secure way. So uh, I hope you guys like that, and uh, let me know if you have any questions. Uh, we'll answer a couple, and then we'll go to Christian after that. Yep. Right here? Yeah, thank you. So uh, I, I asked this question in private, but I thought a little bit more about it, and I think it's of general interest. So imagine that there are two conflicting registrations. Uh, uh, do you enforce it that it's always the first one that is valid, or you present the user with some way of deciding which one he trusts. And the importance of this is, for example, if somebody registers, you know, my name, and they put up a whole bunch of stuff there, except that the, the uh, public key that uh, they publish is not the one to which I control the private key, then I sort of want to be able to resolve that conflict, and I want, you know, my ID back. So is there, do you provide some way of dealing with this problem? So um, just like the domain name system or any username system on Twitter or Facebook or LinkedIn, it's a first come first serve system. So whoever registers a name first, a username or a domain name first gets that name. And the, you should think about the name, the, the domain name as not informing anything about the identity. Right, um, it's only a system for lookups, right? Um, and so if you see a, a Twitter account and it has a username, you shouldn't make any assumptions about who that person is um, because someone could have just got, if someone has DonaldTrump.com, for example, Donald Trump does not have DonaldTrump.com. Doesn't mean that that is him, it just means that someone got the name. Um, so it's a first come first serve, na serve naming system and that's very important to ensure certain security properties, right? Uh, then if you want to make sure, if you want to figure out like who someone actually is, then you go to the contextual information that's associated with the name, right? And that contextual information is uh, the verifications, right? As I showed you before, this is uh, the profile that I traditionally use. Um, this shows that I've verified myself on Twitter and Facebook and GitHub. So if you know me on any of those networks, then you can trust that that's actually me. Um, oh, and if the PGP key you make a signature, it will also be verified? Yes, yeah, and we're going to be adding PGP verification soon. Right now it's just a plain PGP. And Bitcoin too, yeah. Yeah, and we're going to add yeah, Bitcoin verification. Oh, he's, he's telling you to use the microphone if you're talking into it. Yep. Okay. Thanks for your talk. Sure. Have you considered pushing your CV to ICANN? Oh, uh, oh okay, pushing a proposal to ICANN? Oh, oh, I see what you mean. Okay. I, <laughs> no, I have not. Um, do we have one more? Do we have one, <laughs> do you have one more question? I have a question. Oh, sure. Oh. Go ahead, go ahead. Mine is a very quick one. When you release this uh, authentication, you said uh, basically to build on top, and uh, how why label is going to be? Because there, there is a couple of friction elements for the user there. Like I registered with one name back yep. then, and it was like going to Twitter and basically sharing, and there are quite a few like elements where if you build it for your own or your own users, you want them to kind of have a frictionless experience, especially those who don't really know about these things. Like so, yep. yeah. This is the question. So uh, yeah, we're going to be posting the uh, exact timeline for when we're releasing the authentication system. Um, it's probably sometime over the next. Uh, couple of months, right? Um, but you can get updated. There's a chat uh, group that we have going. It's chat.blockstack.org, and you can. I would recommend you join there, and, and then we'll send some more announcements about that. Uh, yeah, and, and I agree. There are some friction points when it comes to doing the verifications that you can see there. I didn't actually go through that process because it, it does take a little bit of time, but we're going to be adding other types of uh, identity verifications where you don't have to only post on a social network. Uh, you can also have, 
something like LinkedIn, right, where you can add a skill to your profile and then other people can vouch for it. So that is something that's a little lower friction uh, and it's a different type of verification. It's something where your, your, your network, your friends and family and everyone and your coworkers, they vouch for who you are and different aspects about you, right? Yeah, quickly. So uh, you showed the uh, search feature. Mm -hmm. So do you have a, like an index w where you can search? Yes. So there's a so there is a search server that that's connecting to that has its own index, uh, and so in a sense that's a centralized system. But the key is that you can all this is open source. The search engine's open source, um, and you can you can specify a different URL, and you can use a different search provider, right? So they, just like you can, you can use a different block stack uh, server, right? And these are, these are endpoints. This is api.1name.com is actually a wrapper around uh, a block stack server. Uh, and when this goes live, it's actually going to use um, a, a public block stack uh, server, actually. But you can, yeah, you can specify your own search uh, system. Yeah. Cool. All right. Cool. Well, I think we're done. One more? Oh. Okay. All right, thank you guys very much. And now we have Christian from Uport and Consensus. Thank you, Ryan. Is this correct? No, it needs to be... Should I take off my glasses? That's good enough. Um, do you, damn. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, um, either that or a uh, normal um, HDMI. Yeah, go for this one. Okay. Let's see if that works. Okay, thank you. Um, thanks to the organizers. Um, my name is Christian Lundqvist. I work at a company called Consensus. We're building stuff um, mostly using the Ethereum platform. Uh, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk a little bit about one of the things that we're building, which is Uport, uh, an identity system. So first, a very brief crash course on Ethereum. Uh, what is Ethereum? It is a decentralized, trust-minimized compute platform. So it's a, uh, it has a blockchain that can run programs. Sometimes these programs are called smart contracts. Uh, when, so a smart contract is a program. It has functions. Uh, you can call these functions with inputs. When you call a function, it updates the state of this uh, uh, of this uh, uh, contract or program and whenever you do a one of these function calls you have to sign your message with with a private key so this means that the hash of the corresponding public key uh, becomes an identifier and so if i if i sign something with my with my private key then the 
the smart contracts can see that, okay, this particular public key actually uh, called the function, and you can use that for for logic like access control. So you can say if the sender is this public key, then do X, otherwise do Y. So in some sense, there is this very atomic notion of identity already in, in any blockchain platform uh, because you have to do this these signatures. So what is uh, Uport? So Uport aims to be a, an Ethereum-based identity system. So it has a bunch of uh, components. One of them is uh, trying to create a a user-friendly key management for end users. This is, in my mind, an unsolved uh, UX problem that, that we're working hard trying to solve. Uh, another thing is to try and tie uh, what we call attributes. So this is basically profile data. We want to tie this to an identifier and uh, in order to to associate data to your uh, uh, to your identity, so the attributes are uh, JSON data, and we want to use um, IPLD whenever that is ready because it's um, it it fits very nicely into the uh, into the structure, um, and the way we do this mapping from the uh, from the identifier to the data is that we use a a, a smart contract um, of a type called a registry so it contains a mapping from the this identifier which is the the pub key hash uh, to this uh, ipfs um, multi hash so what that means is that you can store a lot of data associated with the with the identifier, and you only need to put 34 bytes on the blockchain. So, so that was kind of the link to IPFS, and what's the link to Blockstack? So we recently, uh, consensus recently announced in a collaboration on identity together with with Blockstack and uh, another company called Microsoft. Uh, we're developing standards for this attribute data schema. So we're using the same as, as you saw, um, well, the newer version of, of what you saw Ryan showed. Uh, in addition, uh, Blockstack has this, uh, uh, so Blockstack is aiming to provide support for multiple blockchains, uh, including Ethereum. So you have this idea of top-level domains that can resolve to, to different blockchains. And so you can imagine a, a top-level ID, like uh, a top-level domain like ETH. It can resolve to the Ethereum blockchains. And then you can have a name like uh, christian.eth pointing to, to my uh, U-port identifier, which is, which is that uh, hex string there. So I'm just going to show a little, a little demo of uh, of this. Let's see if this works. So this is uh, very very simple demo app and so the idea here is I have a private key that, that controls my my identity and the private key so this is part of what what we need to fix like right now the private key is basically uh, encoded in these words and here I'm just typing in the words and then protecting them with a password um, and what it generates the public key and the and the public key hash so if you can see here this uh, this is my uport identifier so it's a it's a unique 
uh, identifier that that corresponds to my identity. So if I now want to attach some data to this, I put in some data like my name and like my photo. And I create the new one here. So here you can see the transactions. And now I can look this up. So this is using uh, this is using on the back end Ethereum. So this is a, a view into the Ethereum blockchain and also IPFS. So let's see if this worked. Plug in the ID. I do look up and we can see that. Yeah. Okay. So it worked. I see my name and my uh, and my profile picture here. And we can see on the in the console here what the schema looks like, and this is kind of the same type of schema that that uh, Ryan uh, Ryan showed you earlier. So you have uh, we're using this schema.org standard, and uh, yeah, you have a name, you have a uh, uh, you have an image. And um, yeah, that's uh, that's basically it. Thank you. Questions? <laughs> Any questions? No. Oh, someone has a question. Simon, you're helping um, me out. Yeah. Um, so the. Work you're going to do with Blockstack and Microsoft, um, are you drawing from any kind of existing identity schemas and what, what's the plan going forward on, in that regard? So, so the idea there is to, have a, uh, is to have a system that where you can have self-sovereign identity, so you can control your own identity, but by default you will be using uh, Microsoft services to to help you out. So, for instance, the data uh, you can store the data on uh, on Microsoft's Active Directory, and the uh, like the the blockchain, for instance, could be run on on Microsoft Azure, etc. But the idea is that uh, whenever you want to, you can say, okay. Screw this! I'm going to store, you know, I'm going to store uh, the data on, on IPFS, for instance, like we do here, and I'm going to run my own version of the uh, of the blockchain. And so, um, Blockstack is going to provide like a top level uh, domain um, system is is the current thinking, and uh, f from that you can kind of resolve down to different different implementations. So, so that's the idea to create a very, um, you know, blockchain agnostic type system. Any other questions? It's getting late. Um, thank you. Oh. <laughs>